All right. I think we can get going. So welcome everybody to this session. I think we have a, a really fantastic uh, attendance and audience here. Um, and this is the session on managing, publishing, and archiving imagery generated in the earth sciences. And uh, just quickly introduce myself, Christine Lehnert. I'm running data systems for sample-based observations in geoanalytical observations, uh, among them EarthCam and the Astromaterials data system. Uh, and uh, my co-convener or moderator of a uh, co-moderator of this session is Paul Gignard. Paul, you briefly want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Ginak. I'm at the University of Arizona. Uh, this is my first ESIP meeting, so I'm excited to meet all of you. And uh, thank you very much, Kristen, for inviting me to, to collaborate on this. Yeah, I'm very glad that you're here. Um, this, let me just try to forward here. Um, this session is, is motivated uh, out of a need in my operations of data repositories for sample-based and uh, analytical data in that uh, we start to see a growing demand for managing and archiving imagery. Uh, so the motivation really is in that whole context of open science and fair data uh, that just like our analytical measurements that we manage, image data need to be made available, uh, need to be shared um, within the research community uh, so that we can actually really uh, work with this data and, you know, as I say here, realize the full potential of all the advances that have been made in microscopic imaging and data analytics. And we will hear a little bit from uh, Josh Ainsley uh, in um, uh, 20 minutes or so uh, about those applications uh, that make this so relevant. The other uh, part of that motivation, I should say, is uh, reproducibility uh, considerations. And we have heard uh, multiple times uh, recently that a lot of image data are quite a part of image data and research paper. Papers show signs of mishandling, uh, and we need to make sure that we can rely on uh, what is being shared to be um, to be reusable and the science really solid. So what I call our status or current situation is that the use of imagery, especially microscopic imagery, is growing in the earth sciences, but uh, we don't really have good standards and practices that are shared across different uh, geoscience communities for you know, making these imagery, the imagery and the image data uh, available for reuse and also making sure they are preserved and archived. Uh, but there are actually um, good practices and standards in other domains, and that has gotten me uh, only recently um, to learn about the Nocturne Network, which is an NSF-funded uh, Fair Open Science Research Coordination Network, and that's where Paul comes in, and he will talk uh, about that. Uh, because Nocturne really focuses on the handling of 3D imagery, tomography data across multi, you know, many scientific disciplines. And maybe the challenges that we see right now in the earth science, uh, earth sciences can be addressed that way. And we might be able to establish or adopt policies and infrastructure for publishing and archiving microscopic imagery uh, across domains. Um, again, just to summarize the challenges that I see for us as repositories, uh, for the researchers, for publishers across many of the stakeholders in the research data management uh, ecosystem is that we're lacking standards and best practices. Uh, we're lacking infrastructure and the, the appropriate funding uh, for dealing with image data. 
And there is a cultural issue of, you know, people not really being aware that imagery is part of data and need to be shared as much as the, um, uh, the other observations. So the goals of this session are uh, basically to try and understand what are the requirements, needs, and existing resources uh, for sharing, reusing, publishing microscopic imagery. Um, we want to start off by showcasing some of the existing data systems that support the management, publication, and archiving of image data. Um, we want to learn about the Nocturne RCN and see if there are synergies and if it actually offers us opportunities to participate and thus, you know, move forward with uh, developing uh, standards, promoting standards for managing imagery. And then, um, you know, one of, uh, I think, the yeah drivers for me is to see is there a need, a desire, or a willingness even to continue the dialogue uh, among interested parties here in the ESIP community, and how would we do this? So in our agenda, we have three talks that um, showcase existing tools, uh, systems, the Digital Rock Portal, Strabo Micro, and SAMIS, the Sample Analysis Microinformation System. Um, we will hear from Josh uh, a, a, about outcomes of a workshop that we ran last year at the Goldschmidt Conference on Managing, Publishing, and Archiving Imagery in Geochemistry and Cosmochemistry, and then hear from Paul about the Nocturne Network. And then we want to take the remaining time for discussion, and we have put up uh, three questions where we hope to gather uh, from you input on the needs for managing, publishing, and archiving image data in the earth sciences. Um, explore a bit how we can participate in the Nocturne RCN, what we can get out of that, and then identify if there is a need for any additional initiative that focuses more directly on earth sciences addressing a broad, broader range of imagery uh, specifically because the Nocturne Network uh, focuses more on the uh, on tomography data. And with that, I can stop sharing and actually hand over. Is Masa here? I am here and I apologize Wonderful. for the trouble. If... I got this Zoom thing that wanted to... Uh... <laughs> Identify think... something, and until I actually rebooted my computer, I couldn't get out of it. Oh, now dear. I just actually need to restart my presentation, so I apologize. If there is somebody who could like go in ahead of me, that would be great. Uh, otherwise, I'll take just one more. Yeah, I mean, I was I just put you first because I was concerned about your time frame with teaching. So we could start with Josh and you know. Yeah, please start with Josh, and okay. I'll be ready. Josh, yeah, would you be ready to get going? Yeah, yeah, get in there. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. All right, let me start that. Hi, I'm Josh. Um, I'm a research fellow here at the University of Glasgow. So I will start talking about this outcomes here because I realize everyone is pressed for time. And all right. So here we go. I've changed the title a little bit just to emphasize the fact that what we're looking at here and kind of trying to talk about are the opportunities that we have. Um, and that we identified within the workshop that we were in uh, this summer back in um, Lyon. Let me move my, there we go, sorry. Okay, um, so the co-authors on this, these are the majority of the attendants at the workshop uh, that uh, Kirsten originally organized. Um, and a lot of the data here comes out of my collaborations with various people across the UK and into Canada and the US. Um, but what are we talking about here when we talk about microanalysis data or microscopy data? Well, it's not really remote sensing because that's at the planetary scale. Um, and really for their image, while they have some methods that I would use, um, they are already a large community with their own standards for sharing and archiving data. So we can learn things from there, but that's not the type of data we are concerned with. And similarly with not just generally field photographs. Again, they kind of fall into the more generic 
uh, photography domain space that we would see and are used to with a lot of like the AI and neural networks that we're seeing here. What we're actually talking about is ways of maybe leveraging some of these image processing techniques. And this is where the overlap comes, where you think of images, but applying them to a wider range of techniques and information, which is broadly actually much more known as microanalysis, which is my big background, where we have everything in here from uh, SIMS and laser ablation ICPMS to LIBS um, and lipsometry work. But the key bit here, and a lot of this, as you can see from these micrographs at the sides here, is that we're creating spatial images which have physical meaning. In the case here of the grayscale image at the bottom, this intensity is an approximation of the average atomic mass of the sample as it was imaged by an ion beam. In the 3D reconstruction here, this is a chemical map in 3D taken with a scanning transmission electron microscope. And then on the sample, we also collected electron diffraction data. So we can do a multiple variety of techniques. Each one of these techniques has a specialty strength. And it's these techniques that we're going to focus and want to think about what are the standards and methods that we want to talk about here. And so what motivates this is that we've entered what is called an era of correlated microscopy. What the idea here being is that you would maybe take a sample, maybe put it in your X-ray CT system. And if you then polish uh, at least one surface, you can take a, an energy dispersive spectroscopy map and get a chemical map. And using a little bit of overlaying and squinting, you can overlay the values and that creates a correlative digital twin. And from there, you use your expert knowledge, you usually identify some higher resolution feature you want to look at, either with a scanning electron microscope or a FIB or a STEM or an atom probe. And usually this is always going from low resolution data, i.e. on the millimeter type scale, down to high resolution, potentially all the way to atomic. Um, but they're not always statistical and they're always usually kind of a best guess. So, but this is still, even with these best guesses, this is still enabled by the fact that we now live in an era of high automation instruments and very sensitive detectors that make these things fast to do. So this is the stage we're in. We're currently seeing a development of data-driven and the idea to create um, multi-scale digital twins of our walk specimens that we want to use to inform and our understanding of the natural environment to a much greater scale. But this comes with three big challenges. The first one is how can we effectively manage the large volume of data that are produced? So as we go to using higher raw resolutions, either through CT or through chemical mapping techniques or crystallographic techniques, we start getting large volumes. Similarly, we also want to understand how do we are we able to reuse the data and how do we preserve meaning? And I'm going to say through this talk, that to answer the first challenge, we need to start thinking about developing open repositories that are connected. We need to be able to preserve the raw data with meaningful metadata. And finally, we need to have standardized data formats that allow us to share this data um, in a way that means that one repository is compatible with another. So in order to give you a sense of what I mean when we're now in an era of big data, is these are two studies that we my group presented at Goldschmidt this summer. One of them, uh, my postdoc, Sammy Griffin, she collected, this is a third of a uh, thin section where she collected e electron basketry diffraction coupled with e energy dispersive spectroscopy data. So this is 256 gigabytes of information that she collected in a, over a weekend. And likewise, on a different sample, I collected 256 gigabytes of just energy dispersive spectroscopy data. And using machine learning tools, we were able to start then interrogating the data sets to start making predictions and insights that are only available when you have large statistical data at the micro to nano scale. So this is the first challenge. How are we going to manage this data? One of the things that uh, came up during our follow-up talk I gave at AGU was that potentially we're going to end up with so much data that we'll end up we won't be able to manage it or it won't even be physically possible to store all the data. So we need to start developing how do we know what data we want to keep? And how are we going to keep it? Um, and that, that's the first big challenge. The second challenge is to remember that the publication figure is not the data. What I mean here is this is a series of ortho slices through a three-dimensional tomogram that I created using FISNAM tomography back in 2016. This is what was published in the paper. However, it was extracted from this three-dimensional volume, which itself is actually transformed from this segmented binary set of images, which in themselves are only able to be doing once you've aligned the image stack 
and this is the raw data itself. Now, if you wanted to be able to improve on my results, you would actually want to go all the way back to the raw data in the beginning here in order to then take advantages of advances in uh, analysis techniques and technology. So this is a standard and a methodology that has been adopted by the International Crystallographic Union that they require raw patterns to be saved when somebody submits a new crystal structure because it's only through that way it is future-proofing their data. As long as you have the raw data, we can we can re-index it, re-analyze analyze it. But if you only give me process data like this tomogram or your figure, there's nothing we can do. And the thing is here is like, well, this is still a relatively small data set. If I had added chemical information to this, the data set would get phenomenally bigger very quick. And this brings us to the final bit, which is that we make quantitative pretty pictures in microscopy. They're not just color scales. All of these have meaning to them. It's about the size of the pixel. If this is here is a phase map associated with this spectral figure here, but this, this spectral spectra that you're seeing has to be calibrated properly. It has to be adjusted for background calibrations. And all of this data is preserved in the metadata. It's often usually stored in proprietary formats. And so we need open file formats that allow us to preserve the linkages between the data, the raw data itself that makes this pretty image, and the actual meaning, which is both the physical pixel size as well as the spectrometer and detector information. So we understand how to assemble the data properly. And the more multidimensionality you have in the data set, the bigger it gets. So this is what we need to understand for reproducibility. How much do we actually need? And so this really sets the idea of where the opportunity comes in. Because if we have a lot of data, and now that sounds like a big machine learning task to me, which means I want to actually be able to start assembling it using machine learning algorithms so that as I move through the length scales, these are made on predictions or descriptions of the statistics of the sample, not just where I think is a pretty shiny object in the data set. And then that means that my high resolution data can now be fed back up the length scale into the 3D digital twin that you see here in the center of the image where I can now use that to inform and make better predictions about the sample as a whole. And what, we, what that sets the stage of is that I could measure these instruments all in one laboratory, but most likely I will never have all the instruments in one laboratory or even one university. So I need to be able to set the images into a repository and then be able to pull the images from different repositories and have them be able to communicate with one another in a successful way. So we get back to the need for our standardized data sets, as well as the idea that we want to have analysis-ready data that is connectable across multiple repositories. So how can we do this? Well, we're going to see some of this in the talks today, where we see a proliferation of tools for exploring data. These are tools like SAMIS, Strabo. Uh, one of the presenters at our workshop this summer was also the International Image Interoperability Framework, which addresses a similar problem in the ter terms of museum archives and the digitized museum archives and how can you share those through their repositories. And what's really nice here that I like is a decentralized vision, which is also what's shown here in the Zeiss Data Explorer project, who um, came and talked at our workshop as well. And the key bit that I'd like to emphasize here is it's not just the fact that it, this is the Zeiss marketing slide, but what I'd like to emphasize here is that they say, well, here's one hard drive or one repository we want to be able to connect our repository to other external repositories. And that is the big point where I think where our opportunity is. If we can connect repositories, we can actually start doing comparative studies on metadata studies of old data that we that have never been done before in a way within the earth sciences. So this is me restating the challenges here. Our first is that where are we going? Where, to, where are we going to store all the data? It's too much to store in a single repository, which drives our second challenge, which is we need to conserve, need a way to preserve raw data on these repositories in a standardized format. Um, it's increasing demand for open formats, which is our third challenge, is that we need to really communicate with the vendors that they need to stop producing data in proprietary formats and instead focus on open formats that allow us to share data openly. And, Ultimately, this would give us an ability to have a fair, uh, sort of fair data plus analysis ready microscopy data that would AI tools could just have a field day on, but also it just means that other people can explore our data and share it. Um, and to that end, we've summarized and are sharing kind of 
our progress can be found here on the EarthChem website. Um, and you're welcome to come join our discussion and stay in contact with us through this portal as well as through the discussions today. And I am going to stop there. Thank you very much. I need a mute, sorry. Thank you, Josh. Are there any direct questions to Josh? Just a quick one, any clarification or so? I don't see any hand up. Um, alert me if that's otherwise the case. I just wanted to uh, emphasize also, again, referring back to the document of this session, um, in that document are three questions that we really want to pose to the audience here, gathering feedback on, you know, what are your problems with images, understanding, uh, you know, where you see needs to uh, discuss. Oh, awesome. Yeah, the link is, is uh, Paul just posted it again in the chat. Um, so when things come to your mind while you're listening to these talks, please already start, you know, adding ideas, adding comments, adding questions to the document. Uh, and if anybody is willing to take some notes in that document about the session while it's going on, that would be great. I feel always a little challenged in doing both the moderation and the note taking at the same time. Uh, but with that, so if I don't see any questions right now, then I'm handing over to Masa with our first um, tool presentation. Right. Do you see my screen? Uh, it says has started screen sharing. I don't see. Yeah, now it's coming. All right. So there's a little bit of delay. Let me just yeah, move yeah. things around. There it is. And. To the... It is all right. The... Well, thank you very much for having me. It is the I presenter will... view that we actually see. There, is it good now? Yeah, I, now I had to dupli duplicate the screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Masha Pradanovich. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm going to present on a digital rocks portal. As always, this is a tool that is a result of the teamwork. And I think Chinar Turhan, a current student of mine, is somewhere on this call, uh, but a lot of other contributors as usual. Um, now, our motivation comes from upscaling porous media properties specifically for, uh, for rocks and soil, because that's uh, where my research is. But I would like to point out in connection to Joshua's presentation is that so microtomography data is typically on the micron scale, which is you see an example of a microtomography image here, as well as the result of a simulation within it. So that's this trapped blobs of fluid within the rock. Uh, so rock interfaces are shown in transparent gray. Now microscopy is complementary to that and is actually in the scales below. So a lot of mineralogy information or chemistry information, geochemistry information is actually complementary to this three-dimensional data sets. And today, actually, there's a whole lot of integration between the two, but that's an entire different talk. So what I'm going to talk about is about this microtomography scale, which is typically in microns. Now, if I'm interested in flow properties, for instance, which is what typically we are in in uh, uh, in uh, subsurface engineering overall, then uh, I know the equations, the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, however, they're extremely difficult to solve, though I'm going to point to AI uh, speed up to those. And But at the end of the day, we are interested in something on the field scale. So I have to traverse all of these scales uh, to basically uh, go to the field scale. And for instance, in the case of CO2 sequestration, I would like to run a number of different scenarios that will tell me uh, what the behavior in the field is. The connection between the two scales are these upscaling parameters, such as permeability here, shown as K. In poor scale experiments, image uh, or simulation in image geometry is one way to obtain those. So it would be great to have a repository of this image geometry. And since 1995, uh, onward there has been an explosion of availability of those images and that was pointed out the microscopy developments are paralleling those in x-ray microtomography so there's now 
Lots of data sets out there. What do we do with them? Well, we have organized so-called digital rocks portal that stores uh, data sets, visualizations, associated metadata measurements, as well as simulation data. And we do assign DOI for referencing. Right now, we have about 150 plus, uh, plus public projects. Some of the, the snapshots of those are shown here. So there could be an experimental result. This is velocimetry yeah. in a sphere pack. Yes? I'm going to assume everything is OK. Or they could be just an exit. This is a cross section of a three-dimensional X-ray images where we have um, actually grain failure or fracturing. It could be experimental snapshot of uh, fluid blobs within a carbonate core such as this, or result of a simulation here. This was actually a, a winning video entry in one of the uh, reuse examples that I'm going to show. So. We track because of these DOIs uh, through uh, referencing online, we can actually track, but that's still somewhat manual. Ask me for details if you're interested. We can track the publications that are uh, reusing the data sets. And basically we can at this point see about 200 plus related publications. Some are true reuse. Basically people have downloaded the data um, and uh, and are reusing them, and some are reuse of the original authors. Okay. Um, we also engage community using newsletters, a little bit less so. I'm not the best of them uh, active on Twitter or X. Uh, and um, let me see, but even, um, uh, and then some with, through education that I'm going to point out later. Now, in terms of the architecture, we have a web interface. And then there's a virtual machine that manages tasks uh, and basically uploads images and can do so with multiple at the same time. Uh, we do store uh, data in multiple geographical replica uh, replication. This is sold through TAC uh, infrastructure. TAC is Texas Advanced Computing uh, Center. So we are relying on their data storage and all of the uh, latest and the greatest in the data the servers that they do. Um, now, behind the hood, uh, there is also like in terms of the organizing a database that manages metadata, we have a data model. I'm not going to elaborate other than we just have a standard data set. Uh, there could be a physical sample that is described using these descriptors and then multiple data sets that can be associated with that sample, as well as a publication that we record online. So essentially all of these descriptors of these main parts are entered as metadata during the user upload. So it's a relatively flexible model and it does use some of the specific lingo uh, from the community such as porosity, grain, uh, grain size and so forth. But other than a few descriptors, it could be actually generalized pretty well to any other uh, media with the understanding that there are a lot of porous media have bio origin uh, or fuel cells so in material science. So we could actually translate this quite easily. Now, the way to promote reuse is multiple. At this point, I would say that we are pretty well adopted in the digital rock physics community. That is the community that uses um, uh, micro, uh, microstructure images for simulation of the properties in uh, rocks and soils. But we also did a number of things such as mini courses, uh, visualization contests. So I've shown you the video, which was actually one of the winning entries. Here you can see some image, static image uh, winners. And there's more information on the Digital Rocks portal if you want to dive into it. Now, this is one type of reuse that I did not suspect back in 2015 when the portal started, and that is data science and machine learning that has exploded since. So sort of the proof is in the pudding why we need these portals. Um, so here you can actually see training for one of these parameters, porous media parameters so called permeability, which is a flow parameter. And we were able to train using data from the portal um, 
in a wide variety of data that otherwise I would not have just in my own research group, but is really available only if we sample multiple research groups. And the accuracy is pretty stunning. And there's papers if you uh, want to um, look into it. So this is really becoming a fourth pillar of science. Now, this, in my view, is possible only if multiple people share and come together uh, to these. Now we have, we don't know whether data we use is actually enough. So we used a selection that is available in Digital Rocks portal, uh, but we are posting benchmark data sets that are used in these, uh, these um, exercises. So here is a data set that basically collects from about 70 uh, projects on the uh, portal, and that is used in the training that I just showed. And we have also uh, created a simulation data sets uh, with all of the single phase flow and electrical simulations, as well as some geometric features. Um, that is, so here you see visualization from those, and that's also available so people don't have to do necessarily simulation in order to reproduce uh, what we've done in our training. So that is some first step. Um, now, we would like to, now we have a new grant by NSF, and uh, we need to basically do major um, other improvements in order for this tool to be really usable. So first is what I say, a facelift. We need software stack updates um, and most importantly, data format unification. So the example that I showed was available sort of to my group because we collect data as people want to upload them in all the various formats that has to go. In order to be ready for AI, we should have a single format. That's just, I definitely agree with the previous presenter on the topic. So we will, in this facelift of the portal, probably uh, project everything in the same data format. Um, also, we need to build in analysis tools. I will exemplify some of them, as well as an ability to upload a collection not just uh, individual projects one by one. Now further, uh, we would like to uh, create some of these multi-scale workflows. So match two different scales of imaging if possible. And that is going to be done using a collection from um, NSF project on ocean drilling. Um, and finally connect data with simulation. So here is an example of, this is actually a data set that is both microtomography, but it's enriched with mineralogy information. So it's actually combined and that can affect wettability properties of different surfaces and it can affect then flow properties as a result. So we want to connect to those abilities as well as the capability of simulation directly on the portal. So basically, if you click on a portal image, you should be able to be taken to a parallel computer to do a parallel simulation of a multi-phase flow and get a result like this, this also through the portal. The tool that we're gonna connect to is scalable and it exists, it's LBPM, and this is, con uh, this is collaboration with Dr. James McClure from Virginia Tech. Um, next test is this idea that not all data will be in the same place. So we need to be able to go to different places and gather different data from different locations in a what's called federated learning, uh, machine learning test. And we are ready to do that test. And I'm actually pretty excited about that because I haven't seen them in my community. But in either of those cases, whether I'm uploading a collection of data or I'm sending my AI tools to train in different location, the key question is data quality. Can I assess the quality of the image? So we are gearing up to automate assessing data quality. I'm going to now speak only through segmented images uh, because we don't know the answer yet just quite right for microtomography images, but it's the segmented images, those that have been binarized and we have decided, oh, this is poor space, this is solid space. Those are ready for simulation. So let's see an example of the two samples. If they're uploaded to the portal, how do I characterize them? Do I know that they're quality images, even from this segmented view? What can I say about them? We've been struggling with this in Digital Rocks portal, and so far we just let people upload. Data curation is done manually and sort of 
in this manual process of data curation, we acknowledge that if the data set has been used in a publication and that publication is uh, published in a peer-reviewed journal, that sort of validates that data set. But that's not necessarily true, right? From the just pure image quality perspective. So how do we assess? And you can actually check this code here by scanning this and I can post the, uh, the PDF of these slides as necessary. So first we will actually go to theory and there's something called Minkowski functionals, which are integral parameters for volume, which is same as pore fraction or solid fraction surface area, integral mean curvature of surfaces in Euler characteristic are four numbers that we can actually integrate and check and see where this image is in that space. We can also check for heterogeneity analysis. And here you can see that this Mount Gainier, this, that there's, I could spend also a presentation talking about this, but we have developed an analysis tool that looks at the variation of uh, uh, variation of porosity as you increase the window size. And that can tell you something about the heterogeneity of the data set. And you can actually clearly see that this limestone is more heterogeneous or falls into heterogeneous zone compared to the sandstone. Now, further, if I wanted to also either visualize data set or select a subset for visualization, not all subsets in a larger image are the same. And we are automating, this is work of Chinar who is uh, on this call, we are automating this way to basically pick a subset that is well connected and good quality for simulation. And you can see, for instance, the difference between a random selection and this uh, improved workflow where we maximize certain parameters, you can see much better connectivity, especially in this limestone that is heterogeneous. So that is another automated tool that we're adding, including all of the visualization that goes along. Now, final part for simulation is the image resolution. Here we actually run mock or sped up um, image-based simulation that tells us whether majority of the tight spots in the image falls below or above expected line. And even though this Mount Gambier limestone is heterogeneous in itself, its resolution of the image is way better that captures those heterogeneities. And you can see that this curve is mostly above this red line, whereas Castlegate sandstone actually does not have well-resolved tight spots. And if I was running AI uh, on, uh, this is actually the sandstone that should be rejected for further simulation or uh, image quality should otherwise be improved. <laughs> so I will stop there in order to have time for discussion, but I have many extra slides to go in any direction you'd like me to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masa. This was great. Um, there have already been quite a number of comments in the in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I can start and, answering them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would that would be really good. I think you know, in the um, just making sure that we're going to have time at the end of the session to further discuss. I would, uh, unless there's any like really clarifying question, I would move on to uh, the next presentation. And we, you know, I'm just trying to find out if we can save the the chat so that we capture all that. Um, yes, that so the chat will be saved. saved. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, then let's move on to Scrabble Micro. And I'm not sure. Basil, okay. you can. I'm you going to talk. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Yes. So we get this down now. All right. So, Kirsten, can you see the screen? The... Yes, I do. Very okay. good. Yep. Okay. So this is going to be a presentation about Strabo Spot. It's going to concentrate on Strabo Micro. I am here as well as Julie Newman, and to give credit where it's due. Julie Newman's been the lead on Strabo Micro, working with the developer, Jason Ash, to do that. Um, one of the most important things about Strabo Spot is it is all based on images. The whole system is image-based. 
the spot of Strabo spot is the is um the spatial location of which the data is relevant. So we started as a field application. So if you look on the far right, you see the satellite map. And then from there, we nest spatially down. So that this is sort of in our DNA, this idea of going everywhere from a microstructural image, which is just a micrograph, and the data products, which is shown at the bottom, all the way up through a actual rock in the field back to a map. But at all scales, they're image-based. So that's going to play out as how Strabo Micro works. Just to be clear about what Strabo entails, although I will focus on Strabo Micro, there's a field application, and we're working on Strabo Experimental, which is rock deformation experiments where people are characterizing them often using the Strabo micro application. So all of these aspects are wrapped up into a single system. So what is a spot? As you go from the left-hand side, which is a photograph to a geologic map, to an outcrop, to a thin section, any of those scales can have a spot. A spot can be a point a line or a polygon. We record the data at different scales. This is an old slide, so we only have circles. The important one is the upper right picture, which shows a couple folds, because at a resolution below handheld GPS in the field, we started putting the data actually on the images. So they were called image base maps. Um, and that image became the way of storing spatial data. And the hierarchy of the spots as you go from a thin section to the to the map view or the field view um, is inherent. It's basically it because of this nesting, it's inherently involved. So that finally gets us to Strabo Micro. So we have developed a system for show, show, storing and showing and sharing microstructural data. And it's petr petrological data as well. It can be sedimentary um, rock. So it's any of those combinations. It's both an image and a data management system. Um, the scale is tracked, and I'll talk about that But um, as you go. But at every point, you know what the scale is. So I think on this diagram, you can see that there's some little images on the middle of the circular image. And so those are sub spots that are spatially referenced to that location. Um, the image on that spot can be linked with associated data and that associated data can sit on any other database. So in other words, we provide links to that um, and it's an easy pathway for petrology or geochronology. All right, so when you open this standing application, you get this kind of picture. So on the left-hand side is what we call the navigation pane. So what you see is a thin section. We call this the reference micrograph. So this is the thing that everything is based on. It's usually a full thin section scan. It has a scale on top and on bottom. Those scales are space are oriented in space. We know those orientations. I'll get into that. And there are subspots that can either be those points, the yellows and the blues, or they can be polygons, which are, if you look at the bottom bit, that's that inset. And so there's a whole series of um, images that you navigate to in a hierarchical sense using that navigation pane on the right-hand side. If you look on the I'm sorry, on the left-hand side. If you look at the right-hand side, that's our notebook. In the notebook, it contains both the metadata about the project, the metadata about the image, because not all the images were collected in the same way. You can collect them on any instrument you want. And the metadata about the sample itself. So we'll go through some of that as well. I want to make it a point. The thing Strabo Spot has done very well, I think, through the years is getting the community involved 
not at an end stage, but at a beginning and through the whole process. We are really a community driven activity. So we have involved people in developing our own standards. And despite some of the funding difficulties, we managed to do it internationally because EPOS, uh, the European Plate Observing System, was doing it at the same time. And we just joined forces in both in terms of the experimental deformation, but in also in terms of microstructures and the metadata associated with equipment. So um, the, the imaging machines themselves. So our work is also part of EPOS, that, that the data is completely compatible because it's basically the same um, system standards that underlie that. I also just want to point out that for us, what was important is that we would go and take a thin section and it would have all of this data associated with it um, and that we would go to the field and that that would be located at a specific field position. Because each of the spots in Strabo spots was a point, a line, or a polygon, you would pull down a menu and then once you put in a spot, you have all the vocabulary from the field plus extra vocabulary that is specific to microstructures. Um, for instance, extinction microstructures, as an example. And once again, on this, it was a point, a line, or a polygon. And there's a very clever way you can put a sub-image on this image. So we have ways you can shear it, you can shrink it, um, you can hand place it, you can place it with the grids. So there was there's a lot of different ways, and that was a lot of our effort to figure out how to get these exact positions within the reference micrograph, or if it was smaller scale, to put a smaller scale image and then within that smaller scale image to correctly place your extra image. Because we have the spatial hierarchy, um, we can go from one image to the next to the next. You don't have to use the same imaging system. So for instance, um, there's a phase map and that was collected by EBSD measurements and then um, electron backscatter diff um, diffraction. Sorry, I should clarify the names. And then um, you could go to um, other sort of uh, BSE kind of images and collect a whole series of spots along a line spot. So there was all sorts of ways and they're all spatially nested. For any spot at any spatial resolution, you can add data. So which is to say there is data stored within the Strabo spot system that in this case is chemical data, but it doesn't need to be chemical data. It can be anything. And so, and it's spatially located. It's already spatially located. And you could also, in addition to storing it within Strabo, you can form a link and those links can reach out to any other database. And we just put a few of those possible uh, databases and data systems that they could reach out to. Standards was a little bit of a bugaboo in some ways for us, just because nothing was developed before we did. So what a lot of what our earlier work went into is not just organizing the system, but figuring out how we were going to do it. So for instance, if you take a rock and how you want to get from that natural thin section into a coordinate system based on the reference micrograph. And we basically just said, look, it's just like a UTM grid, but for a thin section and it's given in microns. And that's the system we use. The L, M, and N are directions in space. They're given by direction cosines. So each of them has a unique line in space and they're three orthogonal directions. So the point is that, that we have a way now of connecting the grid in 3D space that you used on a thin section back to the 3D in its spatial orientation in the field. And again, that was stuff we just had to come up with. Image resolution are, is going to, well, our problems and image resolution, um, as Josh pointed out, is one of them. You can't show the image resolution on the application because it would bog down the system. You can choose the level at which you want to show it. 
So this is not how it's stored. We're going to store all the information on Strabo Spot. At least that's what we're doing right now. But you choose the resolution that you want to see it within the app. So you can choose low, high, or medium, and you can do it per image. All right. So I'm going to uh, just go through now a couple of the things we've been thinking about. Storage is a major thing we've been thinking about with this. Um, in where the Strabo Micro has been launched, there's 32 projects on that, each one of them taking about two gigabytes. That's not going to cause us major problems if we keep using it in that way. The problem is as we go to other images, for instance, an electron backscatter fraction image is going to be about 200 megabytes. If we have a things that are intensive, we are going to run out of storage. Right now on Strabo, because we use Exceed, we have enough data storage that we're storing everything. But we don't know that that will be um, good in the future. Um, the files associated are currently part of the project. So which is to say, if you take an um, Excel diagram, we store the Excel plot of the chemical data, for instance. If there's links, the links are stored, but the external resources aren't stored. Um, and that's how we chose to do it. Images are also part of the Strabo ecosystem generally. Um, Field-based ones are um, okay because we've limited them to about 10 megabytes per photo. The problem we're having uh, that might be a problem is when people look at maps. So you can import a map and then a map on that. The same equivalency could happen with Strabo Micro. But for the field app is where our big um, space issue lies that we're using about 1.2 terabytes now for things that people have imported from ArcGIS or Illustrator. And if we ever go to 3D and we've talked about that, uh, we'll likely run into storage issues, but that's not a problem at the moment. Um, all right. And the one thing I would like to do here is stop and just ask Julie Newman if I have missed anything that she thinks is critical while I still have access to go back to that. Um, um, maybe just mention where we're going right now. Okay. Could you say that? So you clearly have an image of what you want to say. <laughs> no, we're just, um, so Basil mentioned the, uh, the collaboration with EPOS. One thing that um, we have just very recently done is actually, uh, managed to connect in the, found a way to connect in the back end. So, um, the, the earlier discussion about connections between repositories. Um, we're, we're working on a way to do that. It's hard with other countries because of laws and countries, but we're, um, we're finding a way to, to make that happen for these data. Um, and then some of our current efforts um, moving forward are working on quality assurance, quality control, um, which is a really, we're, we're just getting started with that and I'm really impressed with what we heard earlier from, from Asha. And, uh, and looking forward to hearing more about that. And then the other thing we're working on is um, collaborative workflows, how you have different people who are working together at the same time or sequentially who need to operate within the same data system. Um, we've discovered with Strabo that that can be, it, it, we hadn't thought about it initially, but that's actually a big problem. How do you keep track of whose data is whose? What's the most recent data? Um, so, so we're working on that issue now as well. I'm scared to go there. That's all I can say. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I think this is just an awesome series of talks that really bring up a lot of, you know, questions to me, ideas, you know, it's, it's fantastic. I have a question. It's basically both to uh, Strabo Micro and the Digital Rock Portal. Uh, do you consider yourself as the long-term archive of this data or mainly as a data management tool? Maza, do you want to go first on that one? I can. I would like to be. But right now I'm just guaranteeing that with my own weight, really. Right? Because it depends on, um, and my own funding has gone up and down and up and down, and I have been stringing things and keeping it alive. Uh, but it is a, 
any kind of solution like this requires a lot of funding and it's not necessarily work that can be done. So if I go to my own research, it can be done and restarted over and over again by every new graduate student. And that's kind of how research moves along. So you kind of shed and redo and shed and redo. Um, if we want permanence, permanence of these structures and being able to rewrite them as necessary in the new tools, uh, that requires dedicated constant funding. And that's now just dependent on like what funding can I win, right? Which is why I'm saying my own weight. <laughs> so. Now it's, I mean, we know it's the fundamental problem of our research data infrastructure. <laughs> yeah. The thing I'll add is that our, our community is relying on us to be that. And we don't, we're a little, it's a little worrisome to be in that position, but that's the situation. But I would also like to say is that these tools are essential show for the future research because it takes often for me two years to onboard a student, graduate student, to start being really. And it's this high performance tools that are not part of undergraduate curriculum, really. And to get somebody who both understands what the data is, that's an engineer with all their knowledge or a geologist with all of their knowledge and this high performance computing tools, which are really domain of computer science, that doesn't exist in one person at the end of their undergraduate degree, right? So that takes a moment. So if we're gonna actually move forward, we need to build these tools that enable a researcher to be kind of uh, fluent in all of the things without going into too much into the weeds of high performance computing. Great, so let's go to the last one of the uh, existing tools and systems. And we're gonna hear from Corina Bennett about the sample analysis microinformation system. Thanks, Carson. Um, so hopefully my slide is showing up. Yes, it is. Okay. Let's see. So um, I am Karina Bennett. I am with the Osiris Rex mission. I've been on the mission for close to nine years now. Um, and like Kristen said, I'm gonna talk about the SAMI system. So I think everybody um, or most people should know about this. So we won't spend too much time on this slide, but Osiris Rex is a NASA funded mission to an asteroid. We took a sample of the asteroid and that sample returned to earth um, in October or September of last year. Um, so our asteroid is on the left and on the right is an image that we just released last Friday, um, the fully open sample return head um, with all of our exciting sample on the inside. So we're spending these two years um, analyzing that sample. And just to put some numbers on what sample analysis means for the OSIRIS-REx mission. So we have about 250 sample analysis team members located all over the world. Um, it's about 250, it's hard to keep track of with students and lab managers, um, a lot of um, change with that, the team. We also have 65 unique analytical techniques. So these are SEM, this is EMPA, micro and nano indentation, XCT, um, organic analysis, thermal analysis, et cetera. Um, underneath that, we have 257 individual instruments. Um, so, for example, a Kamika 100X is different than a Kamika 50X. The Kamika 100X located at the University of Arizona is different than the one that's located at Johnson Space Center. So we're tracking all of that. Um, and actually, when I put this slide together on Friday, we had, I think, seven less instruments um, than we did Tuesday morning. Um, so this is a pretty active count. Um, people are adding new instruments. Um, more frequently, I think, than we expected. We also have 189 defined data products. Um, so this is each analytical technique has a little bit, um, something special about their data products that we want to capture. These are classified into different types. Um, and those types are pretty well defined in our system. So it's tabular data, it's imagery data, um, it's documents, we have image collections and we have, um, data cubes, but we wanted to make sure that within each analytical technique, those were described and defined as kind of 
well as possible. So each one has a core set of instructions on how they should be formatted um, based on the type, but then we went into kind of deeper detail um, based on the actual technique um, that it falls under. All of these data products are informing 121 planned publications that our 250 team members are going to produce. Um, and all of this from sample landing in the Utah desert to our final publications are happening in a two year time span. So that's just to give an idea of kind of the scope of what we're working with. So this is not the right slide for this group of people, but this is what the SAMEs um, acronym stands for sample analysis because it's sample analysis phase of the mission. Information system is not just the software that we're working with, it's the whole thing, hardware, software, the processes, um, the people, everything. And micro, um, it's a play on the term geographic information systems, it's a micro information. Um, there's an element of the system that treats spin sections and other polished um, surfaces as tiny microscopic maps. I'm not going to spend I don't think any time on the talk about this, um, but if people are interested, I can elaborate. So the goals of the SAMEs are um, pretty multifaceted. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all of them, but I will touch on them on this slide. So we are really um, intending to serve as the main hub for all Star Trek sample analysis data and to be the interface between the different stakeholders. And these stakeholders are our curation team, which are actually allocating the samples, classifying them and containerizing them, um, our sample analysis team members who are doing the analysis, and finally our data archive, the Astro Materials Data Archive, where all of this data is going for long-term preservation. We want to track the samples as they move between labs, make sure that they're safe, they're accounted for, and we're also the tool that they use for sample creation, sample subsampling, and sample naming. Uh, we want this tool to be something that people are interested in. We want to foster data discovery and information sharing. We want people to have access to each other's data, um, a fun way to look at it, interact with it, and download it. And then finally, this is how we're facilitating the long-term preservation of these data. Um, scientists give the data to SAMI. SAMI makes sure that it's properly formatted for long-term archiving and delivering it to the ADA. So speaking specifically about data management, SAMI's and Astromat worked very closely to develop a, manage a data management plan that is responsive to SPD 41A which was released after osiris Rex was funded. Um, it was selected and after really the sample analysis plan was developed. Um, so we really tried to do our best on a short time span. Um, and then also working on a plan that to the greatest extent possible follows fair principles. I think those early numbers that I talked about should illuminate how difficult that was. It was a lot of data, it was a lot of people, it was a lot of techniques. Um, so really we decided to focus mainly on findability and accessibility. Um, this diagram here shows the overarching format um, structure of all of our data products. So all of those, I think there's 180 something. Data products follows this basic structure. Um, each one has an overarching metadata file that has all of the information needed to get a DOI and to inform anybody looking for the data what they're looking at. Um, and then this was really important to us. We made sure that every single one of those scientists and every single one of those instruments are exporting or formatting um, into a non-proprietary format. It was not super well received by everybody. It was a bit of a fight to get people um, on board with why that was important. Um, but we made sure we worked with each of the scientists to make sure that they knew how to deliver their data in a non-proprietary format and to really think about what could possibly be lost when they go from the proprietary format they're used to to a non-proprietary one and making sure that we were capturing that information in other ways. So one thing that I think a lot of people were intimidated by was Sammy's meta metadata. Um, so this file here, a lot of these other files, we are requiring our scientists to add. Um, it seems like a lot of work and it could introduce human error. 
we address that um, by kind of being part of the process. So our software, our SAMI system, adds a lot of metadata when the scientists actually upload their data. So everything marked in red, this is that um, product metadata file um, that describes the data that they're um, importing. So everything that is in red is something that the scientists have to type into it and give to us. Everything else on here, the SAMIs automatically gem generates. Um, and one thing that you'll notice is that a lot of the persistent identifiers and control vocabulary are actually added by SAMIs. And this was just a way to add some quality control and consistency. It was really important us to have DOIs for all of our data um, so that we're getting that directly from the Astro Materials Data Archive putting that into the files ourselves um, to reduce human error. And this is just a quick little demonstration. So this is um, what our system looks like. This is kind of, we really wanted people to use it. We wanted it to be easy, we want it to be friendly. So when people run their analysis, they can either use the website, we have a phone application that they can take into their labs. Um, and this is how we gather the information um, that's not marked in red. So basically we load a sample up. This is the one that I have for this example. We log an event. Um, you can select different event types based on what you're doing. In this case, it's analysis. Um, these are gonna auto fill, but we have some SEM analysis that's being performed. When we submit it, they get one piece of information. They get the session ID and that's what they put into their metadata file so that we can gather all of that other information. Um, that we just got from this event. They also get an email um, with that information, so lots of different ways to access it. Um, here's a little bit more information about what it's like to format these data products. So you gather the data. Um, this is when you're gonna do that event that I just showed you. Like I said before, we have required metadata um, that they add to their non-proprietary files, um, add those to them, create that one overarching information about the session, um, that info, the bundle info file, which is basically everything that was the red dots in that file that I showed you all before, zip it up, import it into the SAMIs. The, the way that we instruct people on how to format their data is basically through two types of documents. One of them is a data standards document and the other is a bundle delivery document. We have one data standards document for each type of data. So there's a tabular data one, an image one, an image cube, data collection and document. That's where the allowed non-proprietary formats are listed. That's where the metadata that is common between all of the data products of that type are. Um, and then for each analytical technique, we have these bundled delivery documents and that goes into the specifics. If you have an image, but it's a backscatter electron image made from an electron microprobe, here's the specific metadata keywords that we worked with the scientists um, to gather to make sure that the specifics based on the different techniques are also being Collected also, like I said before, we were really interested in if there's any information that could be lost from going from proprietary data files to non-proprietary ones, this is where we list that information that we wanna make sure that the scientists have other ways of capturing. Um, and these are all gonna be publicly available, um, downloadable in the future from the astro Astrobiology's data archive. Um, and I just have two more slides. So this is, we are not the main archive. We end after two years. There's no more SAMIs, there's no more access to the system. So all of these data are going to the ADA. Um, and so this is just kind of what that workflow looks like. The scientists run their analysis, get data from their instruments. They might do some additional processing. Um, they can take both of those files, do that bundling that I described before where they add the metadata files um, they add the main metadata file, put it into a data bundle, and this has less information than it's going to have when it comes out of SAMIs. Um, as soon as they upload it to SAMIs, it gets a DOI, and that's because we get that from the Astro Materials Data Archive. Um, as soon as it's uploaded, we tack that onto their file. Um, so if anybody downloads it in the future or does a search, it already has a DOI. Um, the scientists then have a three-week grace period where they can identify 
errors, re-upload, um, they can discover something that may be not correctable, and then they can take that out of the queue for long-term archiving. Um, after three weeks, we send that data product package, um, which we've done some additional processing on to make it to a higher archiving standard than what our scientists are uploading. We send that to Astromat. Um, and then when the scientists are ready to publish their papers, they let us know, we let Astromat know that that data should become available and downloadable um, so that when the papers are published, the data is also publicly available. And then my last slide is just some of our actual data um, that our scientists have uploaded on the Astro Materials um, Data Archive site. It's searchable. You can go to a page that has the metadata. And then once this paper is published and this data is available um, publicly, it will be downloadable from here. So hopefully I didn't take up too much time. Thanks, Karina. Great. I mean, it's really interesting to me to see the different approaches. There's quite a bit of overlap, but there are also clear, <laughs> clear differences that come from the sort of purpose and scope of the systems, what their ultimate um, yeah, uh, mission is to fulfill. You know, and that makes it interesting now, I think, for us to to compare. And I I actually put a little question already into the chat saying, you know, when you when you hear about all these systems, how far do they actually already say, oh yeah, that's the system I can use for my specific uh, imagery. Uh, does it fulfill that? What does it not fulfill? And you know, how um, what I didn't say in that that uh, little chat is, you know, how interoperable is this? Can we find um, the images when we look at the analytical data? Does, you know, we have um, systems that keep the measured values. We have other systems that have the images. How do we connect that together and so on? So there's still a lot of open questions, I think. And I think that's a good time to hand over to Paul and talk uh, so that he can introduce us to Nocturne and how Nocturne is seeing its role in in all these challenges with, with imagery. Thank you very much. Can everyone see my presentation? Can anyone see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, so I'm actually a vertebrate paleontologist, and I'm surprised that I haven't been by to visit you folks before. But I, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, learning about how uh, Sammy's is handling Osiris data is is kind of mind blowing. All of the different elements that you've had to bring together. I'd say it reminds me of what Nocturne's trying to do, but we are nowhere near as sophisticated as uh, as um, as what you just talked about. Um, so Nocturne is the non-clinical uh, tomography users research network, and we've really been focusing on kind of the scale that networks have to meet the Office of Science and Technology Policy's expectations about data availability going forward. Um, and so I probably don't have to tell this group, so I'll, I'll sort of speed through this a bit, that um, there's been a big push for open science and fair accessibility around the world. Uh, this has been spearheaded by the United Nations, the European Commission, uh, the G20. And in the U.S., it's the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy that has advanced these goals. Um, the Nelson Memorandum in 2021, uh, excuse me, 2022, set out the expectations for this. There's a QR code here if you'd like to download that. And essentially the idea is to ensure free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research. If taxpayers pay for you to collect data, those data should be available either at the end of the grant period or when the research paper that supports uh, the data is published. And the federal, the, the public should be able to identify which federal agencies supported which projects and how their dollars are being invested in science. And so one of the ways that this has become realized through the National Science Foundation is through FAROS Research Coordination Networks, FAIR and Open Science, RCNs. Um, the goal here is not to create new data, but to organize scientists and specialists around 
the objectives that would be needed to, in this case, ensure that data sets meet the Office of Science and Technology Policy Standards. And if you're interested in learning more about FARO's uh, research coordination networks, the QR code here will direct you to those. And so Nocturne is one of these FAIR and Open Science uh, Research Coordination Networks. We are a community of more than 100 computed tomography specialists. We focus on education, research, and industry. Uh, we collect data using neutron, synchrotron, and X-ray imaging. So our data sets span just a few megabytes up to several petabytes. And kind of trying to wrap our arms around those differences has been a um, an important part of what Nocturne is trying to accomplish to make sure that the data sets are meaningfully accessible to the public. And what's the public going to do with five petabytes of synchrotron data? How do we make <laughs> those data sets actually meaningfully useful? You know, is compressing them accept acceptable and so on? Um, and I'm going to talk on Thursday in another session about working directly with private companies about how to how to see some of this through. So today I'm giving essentially an overview of Nocturne so we can talk a little more about how we can benefit the earth sciences community. So the nuts and bolts of Nocturne are really how we're organized. And this is uh, very consciously arranged and kind of a, an interweaving of working groups and communities. We have perhaps a bit on the nose for fair working groups. Uh, we have three communities. These are focused on education, on research, uh, and on our vendors and industry members, and two committees that kind of oversee all of this. Each has a mission statement, and I'm not going to go through all the mission statements, but just to highlight the, the details of, of what these groups are doing, our findability working group is establishing repository minimum standards for computed tomography data. Our accessibility working group is making sure that metadata uh, are persistently accessible across repositories. Our interoperability working group is using standards that already exist like DICOM and DICONDI to develop unambiguous vocabularies. So we're all talking the same language regardless of the types of uh, CT data that we're discussing. A reuse working group is trying to build consensus around how data should be reused. Do we need licenses for this? How do you appropriately reference someone for the various products that have come out of the original data set that was um, uh, reposited? Our communities are there to represent the broader interests of, in this case, education and outreach, so the interests of educators and the general public. Our industry and vendors community represents hardware and software manufacturers, without whom we wouldn't be able to generate or, or really analyze any of these data. Our basic and applied research community represents essentially the interests of scientists who maybe don't want to put their data out immediately and, and helping reconcile why that's a good idea and what they can benefit from, uh, from doing that. We then have two committees. The Open Science Committee holds our feet to the fire to make sure that all of the other groups are actually meeting the expectations of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And then the Conference and Digital Coordination Committee is making sure that the interstitial connections are maintained between these different working groups and communities. And we're ultimately going to fold Nocturne into a community that already exists, the uh, TOSCA, the Tomography for Scientific Advancement Organization, so that after the, the granting period, we'll continue to do the work that Nocturne is starting, is ramping up essentially during its first three years. And so the, this committee is responsible for that. And so we have members who are parts of multiple, say, working group and committees, and they shuttle information between those parts of the network. So, for example, when findability is developing accessibility uh, or findability guidelines, we want to also make sure that educators are, uh, are part of that conversation. So how do educators find data sets when they're building maybe uh, 3D uh, kits or 3D printed models? How do the research community find data sets when they're trying to conduct large uh, studies? Are, are we taking into account those interests as we develop best practices and gold standards? And so this interweaved model is very much designed to shuttle information through the network relatively quickly and efficiently uh, so that everyone's voice has a chance to be heard and uh, disagreements perhaps reconciled. So we use tools that we're all familiar with now. So we meet on Zoom. Um, we are constantly having conversations through our Slack channel, and we put all of our documentation and our outputs up on our website, uh, which is nocturnenetwork.org. We meet uh, throughout the year regularly, so our organizational committees meet every month, the working groups and communities meet every four to six weeks, and then we have two all-network meetings, one in the fall that's virtual, takes place on Zoom, and one in the spring that's hybrid, so it's mostly in person, and we also uh, uh, put the meeting on Zoom for our members who can't make it. 
We have a whole slew of deliverables we're working on developing, and I'll just go through these quickly. The website is an important one. This is nocturnnetwork.org, one N at the end of Nocturne, the beginning of network. Uh, this is our, our, where all of our resources are going to go. This is our essentially public face to the world and, and represents what we're working on and what our priorities are. Uh, we're putting out manuscripts about these. So our first one, The Role of Networks to Overcome Large-Scale Challenges, is a 75 co-authored manuscript in review right now at uh, the Journal of Tomography of Materials and Structures. But we're also looking at kind of what comes next and you know how well does CT really meet the expectations of FAIR and where do we want to go with all of this in the future. And all of our community members are uh, you know available to be authors on these projects. We're developing best practices for data acquisition, cross-community quality checks uh, derived from sort of all of our expertise and shared experiences. We want to put together recommendations for especially novices to the field and how to incorporate fair and open science practices early on in your data collection and analysis. We're doing a lot to train new members and grow the community through workshops. And then we interface with industry regularly to develop gold standards that meet, again, the Office of Science and Technology Policy's expectations, because without industry buy-in, we really wouldn't be able to develop the software tools that make sure that the data sets can finally um, can be fair and open when they reach their uh, kind of home repositories. And so the question that we want to put to all of you today is really how should the Earth Sciences community interface with Nocturne? Is it useful to have each of you individually become part of the network, in which case QR codes here will give you access to the Slack and our website, or should the Earth Sciences community as a, as a whole, as one voice, interface with Nocturne to try to meet what your expectations and needs are and make sure that those uh, you know, unified expectations and needs are, are, are part of what the network's conversations are as they relate to computed tomography data sets? Um, so there are a lot of people to thank. These are all of our chairs of our working groups, communities, and committees, uh, and our program officers at the National Science Foundation, uh, and, and our webmaster, Dave Eddy, who's uh, really taken on a huge uh, role in making sure that everything that we're doing is uh, is public facing and, and is accessible to, to the world. So um, I'm happy to answer questions about Nocturne, and I'm really excited to talk about how, you know, what the other speakers discussed, how we can really incorporate a lot of these ideas and these needs into, um, to, into Nocturne and how we can kind of meet you where your computed tomography uh, data sharing expectations are. Thank you so much, Paul. This was great. I mean, it really leads us straight into discussion and especially your your question that you just had up. Um, I want to immediately direct to the audience. Where do you see um, an interaction? I mean, I see a lot, lot of, uh, you know, themes or activities that would be really important uh, to participate in and translate into the earth sciences community in many ways. But yeah, I would like to hear from the audience and uh, see your comments in, in the documents as well. Don't be shy. There has to be somebody who can say something. <laughs> I think the uh, answer is a little bit up. There we go. I, I had a question in the slide out chat related to one of the previous talks. This is Doug Neiman from NASA ESDIS. You were talking about consolidating on a standard for an hour by AI data. But you didn't, at least I didn't hear any um, uh, decision on what that standard might be. Could you elaborate on that? That was a question for me? I think so. It was okay. a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so basically, we would like to expose the data to AI. Right now, we are doing it somewhat manually uh, because we are on the same system, HPC, same HPC system that runs both the all of the simulation and AI as well as the storing the data. But in future, what we'd like to do is federated learning. So we would send the code to remote systems and we will uh, ask them without seeing the data, we would run the same type of training and then just uh, 
update the training as we go. That's called federated learning. So we just have to make sure that those systems have the same software and the data is in the same format. Yeah. So that's Does that answer your question? I was asking if you made any decisions on what that data format would be. Um, our research into this area suggests that yes, you know, right the now, format is... So I made a couple of comments. Uh, yes, I made a couple of comments. For uh, image data, just images, TIFF is fairly flexible because it's also visible in the, like it's uh, it shows up in a web browser, which is important from the web repository. Um, and the other one would be HDF5. HDF5 I would deem as a more encompassing of both just image as well as any kind of simulation data. Um, so, so in that sense, I think it's basically between the two right now. Um, most likely uh, TIFF or HDF5 for just images and any simulation output HDF5. So I think there is MLAI tool and available for HDF, uh, it's dwarfed by what's available for standard CSV, for example, um, like this, like uh, spreadsheet output. So, yeah. There's a lot of work to be done here, but I was just interested in the that. spreadsheet okay. output would be an additional like a CSV. Uh, that yeah. would be a non-image format. That uh, that's not what I was commenting on. But okay. yes, results would have to be a CSV or some sort of a spreadsheet. I know that we only have two minutes left, so I... And I'll have to drop off to go and teach. <laughs> this was excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Basa. I didn't realize it was two o'clock central time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that was <laughs> Thank you. the rush that I had. Um, so there's, you know, very little opportunity left to comment, but, you know, I strongly encourage everybody to leave their opinions in these documents. Um, it's, you know, I see still quite a bit of, um, you know, work that we need to do, obviously, to converge on common ways of representing and documenting the images and, and maybe establishing, you know, more, um, yeah, awareness in the community of all the things that are available and, uh, you know, that that people can use it for their different purposes. So, um... so Kirsten, it seems to me that Nocturne is great for what it does um, for that community <laughs> and, and something that modeled after that, that was for microscopy might be really useful. We're probably at that stage where we could do that. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel because I, it seems to me they've done an excellent job with it. I, I'll I'll just riff off of that, Basil. One of our broader impacts is to, you know, if we did this well, be a model that other uh, groups could use and take the, you know, what we've learned works and what we've learned doesn't work and run with that. So if if your kind of community decision is to to build your own version of that, I'd be happy to help get that up and running. So is the underlying software open source and shareable for your system? Uh, for for Nocturne, we're uh, we're essentially just an organization of people putting together our ideas and um, getting our our colleagues and community on board. We're not a repository in and of ourselves, but we have uh, collaborators like Amorphosource um, or Digimorph that are repositories, and so we're working with them to make sure that what we decide as a community gets reflected in how they request data and what metadata standards they're going to adhere to. Uh, and so I can't answer for any of them, but the idea would be that speaking as a community with one voice, we're able to move the repositories or help them move in a direction that facilitates faster, more effective data sharing across their networks. So if you reverse that concept, I mean, I hear you talk, as it doesn't even again, I hear you talk about sharing what you've learned, but there's a wealth of information in this space, just in earth science, what visualization and imagery uh, reports are uh, extremely advanced, which may help you as well. Um, 
So I would I would advocate you looking in both directions. Thanks. Yeah, I was excited to hear about the Osiris Rex uh, data storage processes. A lot of those are where we hope to end up. The uh, the level of um, I say the combination of handholding to move people on board and then automated systems to ensure that there's plenty of metadata redundancy or um, uh, insurance uh, in, in those pipelines. We'd like to be in that place in a few years. And so um, I, I might be um, might be bothering uh, our speaker about that. And I'm happy to, to uh, take on, you know, if there are repositories or processes that you particularly like using or have found effective, I'm happy to learn about them and, and you know, borrow your best ideas and, and bring them back to Nocturne. Uh, this is Rama from NASA, Estes Project, uh, just like Doug. Uh, he didn't mention it, but uh, in our groups, we have had a number of uh, NASA Earth Science Data System working groups. Uh, the process itself has been in place since 2004. And there's a lot of output that has been produced there that you might find uh, valuable to use or look at. So I'd like to, you know, um, Josh showed that we have actually set up a little website that just points to resources. Um, and, you know, I let I will add some of, you know, what, what comes out here uh, over time and uh, encourage you to those resources. There is a section in the document for this session uh, that lists resources. So whatever is being listed there, we can actually make available to uh, to everybody else. But I think it's worth, you know, really maybe continuing even to run a series of presentations over time of webinars to have others who have attended here present about what they're doing. So what you just pointed to Rama with, with what, uh, you know, Earth Sciences NASA has done, we could set up just, you know, a webinar about that. But I'm, I'm also very, very, you know, excited about what Nocturne is doing and the recommendations that would be coming out there. Uh, and I think the most important for me is to, to see, you know, an exchange where people learn about you know what others are doing and seeing synergies and benefits of of reuse rather than starting from scratch and doing <laughs> doing something all over again um, which kind of fragments our uh, our data world even more or our image world and I, I would rather say uh, but you know there's also that question i i'm looking at josh at, right now actually when you hear about these systems would you think that already, you know, use of any of those systems would bring you closer to what you're trying to do with, with your image analysis? Yeah, a lot of them have the tools that that's, I, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's the, the, the biggest thing that I think for, for what I would like to achieve or where I'd really like to see us being able to go as a community is that we need to get to the standards so that we have like the file formats because once we have the file format then writing the code becomes very transparent and that's i think a really key thing is just understanding what kind of data structure do we need or just agreeing on a, a common data structure and vocabulary so that we can assemble the data in a way um you know the samus stuff is really cool because it has um, they, they thought a lot about uh, methodologies for simplifying the process and aligning multiple data sets. That was one of the real takeaways from the talks that we saw this summer. Um, and I really you know, appreciated that methodology of, of creating those marks on there so that we can align a data set. Um, and that, that, that's, you know, um, and then just figuring out the whole metadata structure there is really advanced and clever. Um, and it, the thing here is also, I think it is this federated learning that Mass pointed to is something that we want to think about, partially because I don't think there can ever be one repository that can hold all the data, right? That this is the real, the real problem that we have. Um, so if we can work on standards and figuring out what is a standard file, what is a standard shape that we want to see, 
Um, because even something like SAMIS could be adapted to read in certain standardized formats of data. Yeah, absolutely. Where, you know, they have a lot of their GIS architecture at the top for playing with the data, you know, graphically playing with it and exploring it. And that's the fun bit. But at the end of the day, we just need to be able to have an agreed underlying structure. And now I feel like I've said too much, so I'm just going to let other people take the floor. I see already connections there. I did, but I also obviously, you know, in running Astromat, I'm I'm appreciative with Samus about the way image data gets packaged for the archiving. So you have this, you know, basically covering the whole life cycle of the imagery from getting it off the machine, controlling metadata, and then packaging it up for the for archiving and and potential. Uh, obviously also discovery and access, you know, through a repository. So that um, we're seven minutes over time, which really shows that, you know, people have been engaged. I really would like to thank everybody who participated in this session. We, we've had over 40 people at times and, and throughout most of the session. So, um, you know, thanks for staying on and really, um, we will reach out to you. If you have put your not yet put your name into the list of attendees, please do so because we will follow up with everybody, um, giving a summary of what came out and then hopefully setting up some follow up events. Thank you so much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the ESIP meeting. It was <laughs> challenging to be among the first first sessions here to get it going, but it was great. Thanks.